Tonight I'm going to talk about faith. But I'm going to talk about unbelief and casting out unbelief. Not many people realize how dangerous and sinister unbelief is. Unbelief is a spiritual cancer that will destroy you and destroy your capacity in God. Destroy you, block you from miracles. And we need miracles. All of us need miracles. Your family will get sick. Oh, I'm not going to prophesy that. But they may get sick someday. You need the power of God over your life to get them healed. We need miracles. The more visible sins that we commit are easily seen and recognized and then dealt with. So they should be. Unbelief can live behind the pulpit and live in the pew unchallenged. It is so common. It is totally possible to be an unbelieving believer. Do we believe in Jesus? Absolutely. Can I have faith that this person will be healed when I pray for them now? That's where you find out if unbelief is there. I hope this evening it'll be a turning point for a lot of you and that your spiritual power, your life with God will rise to another level. Mostly we rise, we hear truth and then we work with truth and work truth into our life which may take a few weeks or a few hours depending where we are. But it's see, letting truth become revelation inside of you. And that's what I'm trusting tonight. The truth about unbelief and faith will become revelation inside of you. And then it's all over by the shouting. Faith is the currency of heaven. Dollars are the currency of Australia. I've preached a lot in Pacific Islands. and Some of the islands you buy your wives. And to buy a wife, the price is, usually includes a pig, a bag of flour, a bag of sugar, and other such things. Certain types of seashells and other things like that, and a whale's tooth, usually. It's very important. And so with this currency, you go and buy a wife. But if you had a pig and a bag of flour and sugar and a whale's tooth and some shells, I don't think you'd buy many Australian women as your wife. In fact, they might hit you on the head with a pig. <laughs> and the father of the bride might kick you out. But in those countries, that is the currency. Faith is the currency of heaven. You go shopping in heaven with faith. Faith draws the thing from God that you desire to your life. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And in the early days, as I was understanding, coming to understand the wonderful truths of God and how to use them, my response was, then God, I need more faith. And I prayed for more faith. How many of you here have prayed for more faith? Two. Well, there's usually three. <coughs> Especially in a crowd this big. Yes, I've prayed for more faith. I had no idea that unbelief was my problem. The natural assumption is I need more faith. I was like the father of the boy in Mark 9, 24, where the father cried out and said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Has anybody been like that? I believe. Of course I've got faith. But help me where I don't quite believe enough. But that's not the answer. I'll tell you the answer tonight. I'd like to read 
Mark 9, 17 to 29, reading from the New King James. <clears throat> then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered and said, O faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at his mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? The father said, from childhood. And often he's thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, became as one dead, so that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. When he had come into the house, the disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we cast it out? I've asked God that same sort of question a hundred times over my ministry life. God, why couldn't I do that? God, why, why? He said to them, This kind can, kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. This man recognized his problem was not that he didn't have enough faith, but he had unbelief. He said, Lord, help my unbelief. It's possible to be an unbelieving believer to have both commodities in your spirit at the same time. That is, to have faith and unbelief present at the same time. The unbelief will nullify your faith and make it of no effect. In Matthew 15 and 58, Jesus said this about unbelief. He went to Nazareth, his hometown, and he said, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. If the unbelief in those people could stop the power of the Son of God, what could it do to a man like me? or a person like you. Unbelief is a sinister, dangerous commodity. In its own realm, it's very powerful. But faith is very powerful too. Your unbelief will not affect me. But my faith can't change your unbelief. It is your decision. To be a believer is a decision, is a decision you'll make. I will believe you, Lord Jesus Christ, against everything my eyes see, I believe you. And I will walk with you. It's a decision. It's a decision. But when you make that decision, <clears throat> you'll discover that the power of God will attend you and his supernatural events will occur for you. I found that. Now, I want to read you the same story from Matthew's Gospel. Mark's Gospel is really 
the Apostle Peter's sermons. Mark is the scribe that wrote them down. But they are Peter's words. And Peter's an evangelist, and you can see that in his gospel. I'm not going to go there tonight, but however. Matthew was a tax collector. So he was involved with counting money and like an accountant-style person. And he noticed details. Evangelists don't bother about details so much. Just as long as I get the broad brush out there, that'll do. But accountants, it's everything's got to be balanced to the cent. I said, well, heck, if you're short of five cents, I'll give it to you. But they'll work all day to fix that five cents up. I'd never make an accountant. I'd be more like a Peter. He'd say, come to me, I'll climb out of the boat and walk in the water. That'll be my thing. But I'll let this guy here fix up the five cents. Now listen to this passage in Matthew. And I'm going to draw out something that Matthew says that Mark or Peter didn't remember or didn't say. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic, suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't cure him. Then Jesus answered, O faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. The child was cured from that very hour. Now it's the same story, but Matthew adds this. And I'm so grateful to the Holy Spirit that he added this. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move, and nothing, no thing at all, shall be impossible to you. However, this kind doesn't go out but by prayer and fasting. You'll say to the mountain, move from here to there. If you have a faith as a grain of mustard seed, very, very tiny seed, so Jesus is saying, you don't need much faith. A tiny amount will do. I'd spent years praying for great faith, big faith, a lot of faith. But he said, look, faith is a grain of mustard seed. That's enough. It's got nuclear power in it. Just get rid of the unbelief. Unbelief will nullify it. Get the unbelief out of your spirit and let that nuclear-powered faith a tiny amount of it will blow the kingdom of the devil to hell. So, I want to talk about that tonight. You'll move a mountain. Every, every culture has its own peculiarities of language. We Aussies do. We talk about, man, he lives way out there where the crows fly backwards. Only an Aussie would understand what that is. You could get an American with a PhD, he wouldn't have a foggiest clue, he's uneducated. <laughs> or we say, that bloke, he lives out past a black stump. Well, the PhD man would go looking for a black stump. They mightn't even find a black stump, let alone the bloke that lives behind it. We know what we're talking about. He lives in the middle of nowhere. Or we talk about chooks instead of chickens. I was preaching in America and I'm talking about a chook, you know, killing a chook. At the end, this fellow came up to me and he said, I've been puzzling, what's a chook? I said, it's a chicken, a chicken. Oh, as if, why didn't you say a chicken? And I was talking in another place and I said a fortnight ago I was in such and such a town and God did this. And the bloke came up to me after the meeting and he said, I cannot work out what a fortnight is. I said, oh, a fortnight's two weeks. And he looked at me, puzzled face, he said, a fort 
in the night is two weeks. <laughs> and I realised how stupid we are saying fortnight. <laughs> so we Aussies have our own language. We know what we're talking about. Nobody else does, but we do. The Hebrews had their own language too. They all knew that a mountain was a kingdom. They knew that, as we know, a chook's a chicken. And so they could use that language. You, know, you look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and all and exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Well, that's crazy unless you know what he's talking about. He said, it'll come to pass in the last days that the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will be established on the tops of all the other kingdoms. And there's going to be a worldwide revival and all nations will flow to the kingdom of God. Talking about the same thing that Joel 2 is talking about. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Or Revelation puts it this way. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ. So a mountain's a kingdom. So Jesus is saying, it's simple really. You say to the kingdom of darkness that's pressing this evil power on this boy, move from here to there, go. And it'll obey you if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. You've often heard me say here as I pray for the sick, spirit of infirmity, go. I'm speaking to the kingdom behind this sickness. I'm not speaking to the person. Person is irrelevant at that moment. I'm dealing with a spiritual power that enforces the problem. And as soon as you remove it, either the body recovers or the gift of healing flows in and everything's okay. Jesus went about doing good, Acts 10.38, and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So the devil is pressing asthma on somebody. If it's you, we'll shift it off you tonight. He's pressing arthritis on somebody. And they say it's incurable because there's a, there's a spiritual power pressing it on you. We'll shift it tonight. Or you've damaged your back and it won't get better because there's uh, some spiritual power pressing on that thing and holding that damaged spine to your spine. He said, you'll say to the kingdom of darkness, now this boy took fits. And anybody would say, well, he's got a medical condition. But Jesus said he had a spirit condition that was behind the medical condition. And he rebuked the spirit. It left him. And the boy was cured. And so many people have been healed here over this camp and all the time. Now, the real antagonist in this story was not the demon in the boy. It was the unbelief in the heart of the disciples. That was the real antagonist. In your heart, does unbelief live there? That'll curse you. You want to get rid of that. That's not a passenger to take round with you. No, you don't want to take him home. Leave him here. Let Pastor Mark sweep him out after you're gone. You go home without him. The disciples were concerned with the demon in the boy. Jesus was concerned with the unbelief in the disciples. The disciples' question was about casting out demons. Jesus' question was about casting out unbelief. Now, unbelief comes in disguises. 
Satan doesn't walk up to you and say, I'm Satan. Well, it might occasionally, but for heaven's sake. He comes up like a, like a deceiver, which he is. Jesus called him a murderer, a liar, a deceiver, amongst other names. What's, what's unbelief? Anybody here is ever worried? One person, two people. That's amazing. You've got a good church here. Uh, it's incredible. Just two people. Anybody here ever worried about the same thing twice? What about ten times? Did the first nine help? <laughs> and yet you did it again. What, are you stupid or something? Oh, we all have, haven't we? Worry is only unbelief, dressed up with another name. For if you believe God was going to help you, you wouldn't worry. Worry is just unbelief. So next time you're worried about something, recognize your antagonist. It's unbelief in my heart. That's what it is. And I'll worry, 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 worry. And I'll be awake at night, at midnight, because I've worried all day. So I'll pull the worry out and I'll worry a bit more so that I'll make sure I can't sleep at night either. What is unbelief? Cast out unbelief. I'm going to tell you how in a moment. What about stress? Anybody here ever got stress? Feel stressed? Stress is unbelief on steroids. That's all it is. But it's unbelief. If I had perfect faith, I don't need much of it, just a mustard seed size, that's all. So I'm not looking for huge amounts, just want a mustard seed. And I want to settle myself down into the spirit. Drop down from your mind into the spirit where faith lives. For faith's a spirit commodity. It's not a mental attitude. It's a spirit commodity. Drop down into there and say, Jesus, are you with me just now? And listen for him. And if you can hear him, he'll say, yes, I am. Because he said, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. And if you're with me, am I going to go under, Lord, or are you going to look after me? I'll look after you. Now I can have faith. I've heard from God. I can rest now. I'll say, God... Hasn't rained yet. I need it. I'm with you. And you can start to call that rain in. Because you and I live with miracles. We live with miracles. Miracles come out of faith. What about fear? Anybody here ever been afraid? Fear is just unbelief in manifestation. That's all it is. Because if I had faith that God Almighty was with me, I wouldn't be afraid. That man there that got saved this morning, I happened to touch his arms. He's got muscles like iron. <laughs> if I was walking down the street on a dark night and he was walking beside me, I wouldn't be afraid. <laughs> I reckon that bloke could tune him up. If anybody tried to touch us, I got one good hit and a kisser and it'd all be over. <laughs> and if it wasn't over then, I reckon he could drop him with another cut on the next show. <clears throat> then after we've done that, we preach to him. <clears throat> <laughs> but however, if I'm walking with the Son of God and I'm aware of him, if I learn how to feel him, if I learn how to become aware of his presence, it's just as simple as walking into Mark and Grace's home. Now, I could never do that in my imagination, but I can now because I've been there. On my own, with God, hundreds, thousands most likely of times, I've entered into the presence of the living God. I know the way. I mentor people on how to do that in that thing on prayer. And you just enter the presence of God. 
take seconds. And when the fear would want to come, I want to drop out of my situation and enter the realm of the Spirit. And my first question will be, Lord, will it be all right? Listen to him, because faith comes by hearing a word from God. When my heart specialist gave me three months left to live, and my cardiologist said to Anne and I when we went for our next appointment, the defibrillator won't bring you back much more, Clark. There's not enough heart muscle in, left in your heart to bring you back. The heart specialist said, go home and get your will in order. Make sure everything's okay. In fact, these were his words. He said, Clark, as a preacher, you've taught people how to live. Now go home and teach them how to die. Well, I never bothered accepting those words, so I thought I might keep on living myself. And I did. I did. I'm alive tonight. I'm like doing okay. And God just did heaps of little miracles for us. So he can do them for you. Faith. Faith. When the life gets tough, you need spirit. Faith in Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So fear is just a manifestation of unbelief. Satan's purpose is to create uncertainty in you. To take away the solid rock that you stand on to fight. Because you do have to fight sometimes. Is everything always easy for Anne and I? No, it's not. But we can stand on a word from God. And we'll still be standing there when the cyclone has passed. And God will look after us. And I am persuaded with every fiber of my being that you too can stand. And I'm positive that many of you do on the rock of ages and a word from God and you'll still be there when the storm's over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pure faith has unlimited power. Jesus said, all things are possible to him who believes. It's got unlimited power. You just learn how to use it. You want to look for unbelief in your own heart. Check your heart out. Check your spirit out. And if you can find unbelief there, eradicate it. In the last two minutes, I'm going to tell you how God showed me to eradicate it out of my life. I've noticed this in my life. When you understand something, it's simple. Complex things, if a man talks with complex ideas, he doesn't really know his subject. Somebody who really knows his subject can make it simple. Even the most profound thing. So, look for unbelief. Learn to recognize its language, its feelings. So that, ah, I got you. Because he comes in disguises. He wants to hide. He doesn't want to be seen. If you see him, you can... Cast him out. Why can we cast out spirits? Because Jesus destroyed their power on the cross of Calvary. He was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Now you and I go about doing good and healing people who are oppressed. And we walk free of unbelief in our own heart. I said to God, Lord, how do I get rid of unbelief? For when I recognize the disguises of unbelief, the language of unbelief, I said, God, I've got it in my life. Unbelief. And I don't want it there. How do I do it? And I was in prayer, just like I do, I fellowship with God a lot. Just in the early morning hours, I wake up, slip downstairs at home and just sit in our lounge chairs and be with God. And it was one of those times that I said, Lord, how do I get rid of it? And flashed in front of my spirit a television screen, a computer screen. And then I saw the mouse. I don't mean a real mouse, I mean a computer mouse. And I 
I'm not totally dumb. So I realized the Holy Ghost wanted me to do something. And I saw on the screen, doubt. And I knew it was referring to my spirit. And I remembered when I'd walk up against cancer. And my spirit would shy away from it. And I said, ah, it lives there. I hadn't recognized it before. And since then we've seen quite a lot of people dying with cancer healed and set free. Medical clearance, everything. All sorts of stuff. And I said, Lord, what do I do? And I saw this unbelief in my spirit represented on the computer screen. And I clicked on the, com on the mouse, clicked on that unbelief and moved it off the page. And a terrific joy came into my spirit. I said, God, was it as easy as that? And it was. It was. I can because he has. Because Jesus Christ has destroyed the devil, I can shift him. Because when pure faith is in your heart, he's got no hope. He's got no hope at all. It is easy when you've got pure faith in your heart to move him off the page, to shift him. He often oppresses me. And oppression is dreadful. It's a horrible feeling. He often comes just to discourage me, dissuade me from going to a place, or dissuade me from endeavouring to change the atmosphere over a church that I go to and over the town as I go in there to make a difference in that community. And I meet often the Prince Spirit over that place. And he tries to dissuade us. But see, you have to know truth. I know that through death he destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil. I know it. I know that I know that I know. And I tell that devil, ah, say to him, in the name of Jesus I come, not in my name, but in the name of the one who destroyed you on the cross of Calvary. Now in the name of Jesus you go. And I know he has to go. That's the secret of faith. You have to know that he must go. And he has to go from your family, from hurting you. He has to go. He hadn't got a choice. Jesus destroyed him. That word destroy doesn't mean made him non-existent. It means that he rendered him powerless. Now, the devil has this power. He has the power of bluff and intimidation. He seems to me to be a bit like a toad who can blow himself up and he becomes so big and fearsome looking. But he's only a toad. Prick him and it's all hot air. And I've found, without being facetious, that the devil comes as if he's got all the power in the world and he's going to give you the hardest fight on earth. But when you stand on truth, when you know that you know that Jesus Christ destroyed him and you know that as a son or daughter of God, he must listen to you. That you have power given to you by God. Then you'll walk free. And young people, for you too. A lot of young people commit suicide because they get mixed up in their head. It's only a devil. You can speak to that devil. Tell it to get out. It's got no power to you. I don't mean you talk, think about the devil too much. I never think about him unless he comes around to annoy me. I'm here to promote Jesus. But at the same time, we've got to know our enemy and how to deal with him. So, tonight I want to talk about, and I have talked about, unbelief. And expose it so that you can recognize it if it's in your own heart. And life is fluid, so tonight it may not be there. 
But in two weeks' time, something comes up, gives you a shock, and it could be there. Settle yourself down. It's not an emotional thing. It's a deep spirit thing on the inside. Now, your emotions can be involved, but click your mouse on him. Shift him off the page. You ought to practice doing it tonight. You'll discover how simple it is because Jesus has dealt with him. He's only a bluff artist, but he's very good at his job. He's a deceiver, but my, he is good at it. He's good at it. He'll come to defeat you, but you can defeat him. Unbelief. Unbelief will nullify faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. You have faith because the Bible says in Romans 12 that he has dealt to every man and woman the measure of faith. So you've got a measure of faith. You only need a mustard seed. But that much. That's not much, is it? You've got that much. God gave it to you. You've got faith. Use that nuclear-powered faith to blow up the devil's kingdom and to make a way for you and stand with a living word from God and require it to come to pass. You know, I have to pray for a while, but you're not made of jelly. You don't melt in the rain. You're okay. You're Australian. You're bush people. You're tough. So if there's a bit of a fight on, don't believe for a long fight. You'll have one. Believe for a very quick victory. And you'll have it. So whatever you believe for, you'll have. You'll never rise above your believing. And you'll never be below it. Your believing determines your destiny. No question at all. Could we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we all thank you for your Word, for the truths you teach us in your Word, that we can stand on the truth of the Word of God. And there we can fight whatever battle we've got to fight, and we can win the victory. God, you are amazing. Train us to live in your word and to use it correctly. Father, I pray that your spirit will settle on every person here tonight that wants you to. And I ask now, God, that you would let people see where there's unbelief in their heart, and if there is, they just get rid of it. Because it doesn't belong there. Faith belongs in our spirit. Nothing else. So, Father, we honor you. We are proud to be your children. We are proud to follow you, Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We are so thankful that you picked us up in the midst of our sin and iniquity, you cleansed us by your blood. You called us your own. How good you are to us. Father, we ask you for rain throughout the West. And we ask without doubt that you'll send rain across the dry inland part of Australia. We pray that the heavens would open and rain would fall across this land. That farmers and cattle and sheepmen, the country towns would prosper and do well. We ask you, God, that cattle prices would rise and sheep 
We ask you for prosperity so that we can care for our families. We ask you for the businesses in these local communities that they will prosper too. We pray that you give the government wisdom that they would treat the bush fairly and with generosity. God, we're your children. And I know heaven is listening to us tonight. Pour out your spirit. And pour out natural rain. 